Welcome to The Golden Shadow. My name is Elsa Polizzi. And I'm Aaron Rogerson. And today we're talking about the archetype of the wounded healer, which is a way to think about a pattern of experience where an individual sustains a deep trauma or wounding and through that experience finds resilience of spirit and an understanding of life that not only brings personal healing, but often collective healing as well. They're able often to heal themselves, and despite their wounding and really because of that suffering, bring healing to others in turn. Right. So we think of this as being an archetype because there are old examples of this, mythological mm. examples of this. Mm -hmm. It's something that's been dramatized uh, long in the past, but it's also something that is very common nowadays mm -hmm. to observe in people. And, you know, you could say that the, the wounded healer archetype is something that we all take on at certain points. Yeah. And that's sort of this mode of being, of becoming a healer or taking something that you've learned and wanting to pass it on to someone else to help them. Mm -hmm. And you've only learned it because you've experienced it. So yeah. if you've experienced pain, you can teach someone else about that pain right. if they're going through the same thing. So anytime we're offering support to other people or lifting other people up or trying to care for someone who's going through a difficult experience, if you've been through the same difficult experience already, you have some kind of wisdom that you can pass on to that person that can't necessarily be replicated mm -hmm. without going through the experience in the first place. Yeah. It right. has this like quality of shaping an individual through the kind of like fires of suffering and mm -hmm. pain where you come out the other side being uh, changed and transformed yet at the same time, not broken. And I think that's a big part of the wounded healer archetype. And I like the point that you brought up because I think, especially as I was considering this topic this week, that the wounded healer to me seems like this incredibly important archetypal structure within all of us. Mm -hmm. How do how do we deal with trauma, with suffering, with pain and difficulty in our life on any degree and not have it destroy us, not have it break down the frameworks within, but rather work through it, overcome it, integrate the experience and and through it gain a sense of deep understanding of the the nuances of life. Right. Like we all need to be able to tap into that to some degree. Mm -hmm. So we can connect this to a lot of the things we've talked about in the past. Mm -hmm. Individuation. Yeah. We talk about it as, as being forged into the person you're meant to be through yeah. difficult experiences. Hopefully not too difficult. Hopefully not too overwhelming and damaging. But difficult experiences nonetheless. Suffering mm -hmm. sculpts you yes. into a more complete person. Mm -hmm. It also connects to uh, the puer from mm -hmm. last week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the opposite effect of not experiencing enough suffering or difficulties, uh, not being shaped by challenging experiences, leads you to be a less complete person yeah. than you would otherwise be. And the wounded healer is a little more narrow in focus, I think, than yeah. the, the puer is. Mm -hmm. Puer is a little more of a broad term, I feel like. But, but the wounded healer is someone who has been shaped not just by challenges, but has been shaped usually by something really injurious yeah. really damaging yes. and it's more like they were stabbed through the heart or through the mind yeah. or they were shattered or yeah. fractured there's all these sort of metaphors you can throw out there it's like it's not just someone who's like oh like he like struggled a bit it's like mm -hmm. it's usually someone who has some sort of cataclysm yes. some kind of uh, tragedy yes. or just something that was so difficult that um it could have destroyed them yes but it didn't. Yeah. That's, they were able to recover from it somehow. Yes. That's kind of like the more, the classic traditional associations to the wounded healer. And I think it's important to get into that because it does characterize what we tend to see evolve from, uh, for certain individuals who experience some incredibly deep traumatic experience that it requires that they go extremely deep into themselves and kind of find these stores of power and spirit and potential that helps them navigate through or overcome or find meaning in the tragedy. And when that happens, it has this quality of being able to transmute that suffering 
and to kind of reform it in a way. Like you turn that suffering and that tragedy into this powerful moment of individuation, you might Mm -hmm. say, thus learning about yourself more deeply, learning about the world. And it often does lead to an individual having this deeper sense of empathy, understanding of others, this just heightened awareness of uh, the kind of difficult strains that kind of run through the world. And that often then leads to that individual becoming the quote unquote healer. Mm. And it's because they've been through the fires of difficulty that have shaped them and come out the other side. Right. And, you know, I think spirituality um, can be tied into this. A lot of what we consider to be spiritual practices or Mm. getting into spirituality However, we tend to think of that often has to do with healing, right? That's a kind of like a core thing of all the spirituality is like trying to heal, trying to get to a place of balance, Mm -hmm. trying to um, resolve or ameliorate some kind of deep suffering, even if it's just sort of a confusion or a kind of feeling of even like boredom or meaninglessness. Often what drives us onto the quote unquote spiritual path is some sort of tragedy Mm -hmm. or wounding or something that really makes you feel like, oh man, I'm screwed up or like my marriage fell apart Mm -hmm. or I lost my job and my world's been shattered. And even that, you know, that's a very, very common experience. I think that'd be true for me and for you Mm -hmm. to um, reflect upon our own paths is that the reason we were pushed into this realm to talk about things that are essentially aimed at healing or self-help or making sense of the world, we wouldn't be on this path if we hadn't experienced some sort of opposite direction of like deep confusion, (laughs) deep suffering, uh, deep feelings of being lost, of being alone, um, trauma, you know, serious anxiety. Um, So, well, I don't think either of us are claiming to be like, fully embodying the wounded healer archetypes. It's like, we're both like relatively young, I think when it comes to being a wounded healer. Um, but still you can understand this path. Yeah. You can understand the spiritual path. You can understand the desire to want to, um, make yourself whole again or stitch up these tears in your body and get to a place where you've healed enough that you can pass on that healing power to those around you. Mm-hmm. And that's really the sign of true individuation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When you've become so complete or your cup is so full, let's say of energy and power, that's now overflowing mm. and people around you can catch that energy yeah. and they can use it to heal as well. Yeah. What you're speaking to kind of brings to mind how this type of wounding and difficulty and struggle works as this incredibly powerful initiator Mm-hmm. For individuals, it kind of shocks you out of a, I don't know, sort of period of life or even like a, a youthful naivety into realization of something incredibly raw and overwhelming and the, just the realness of life. And mm-hmm. it's like you're getting pushed out of that zone of safety and comfort and the known and you in some ways are embarking on this path of needing to come to terms with your own uh, wounding or trauma or what have you. And through that, that journey kind of teaches you these skill sets. You gain insights, you gain wisdom, you integrate your own experience to some degree. And then you see that out in the world and it it works like this call, honestly, to to step into something greater Mm -hmm. because you've had to Uh, do that internally you've kind of had to allow the energy of that wounding to uh, allow you to dive very deeply into yourself and as you come to a place more of balance or of understanding the question is what are you going to do with it Mm -hmm. now as you feel like your cup is full enough do you turn towards your family your community your friends and for the wounded healer type i think as they come out of that dark shadowy cave that they were in inside of themselves they then feel called to connect with others in this very direct way in that kind of healing profession way and that can be that can manifest as something that i think is very typical like a therapist or a Mm. nurse or a doctor or something like that but it might 
it might take other forms as well. Um, wanting to kind of speak the words of the insights that you've gotten through yeah. um, some sort of creative endeavor, you might say. Mm -hmm. But the wounded healer really has been like initiated into a new realm of psyche and potential. And I think the greatest moments that I've had when I've experienced this, it's like I felt like my life got like knocked out mm -hmm. and then I got knocked onto a new path. It was almost like a kind of revelation because the, the trauma or the wounding or the difficulty was so intense that it felt like I can't go back to the way my life was before. Right. And that kind of call to a new adventure, you might say, had to be heated both through my own healing, but then towards recognizing what way I could be of service in a way um, mm -hmm. to the greater good. Yeah, I think uh, you just did a little bit, but I think it would be helpful just to kind of like throw out some really straightforward examples maybe of how mm. this is manifesting in the modern world. Okay. Because I think there's all kinds of different ways you could look at it. Mm. Like one example, so someone that I've, I've talked to um, on my channel, uh, he's someone who opened a gym, right? Mm. And the gym mm -hmm. like had programs that were specifically aimed at helping young men mm. kind of find a way to be like more balanced. Yeah more aware of their own sort of anger and their mm. kind of feelings of weakness and powerlessness yeah. and how to channel it in like a healthy balanced way, which is to be kind of like getting in touch with your body, getting to understand yourself physically, but also getting into the idea of feeling empowered to protect other people. Yeah. Like not teaching young men how to fight to, to be destructive, but mm -hmm. teaching young men to feel like protective. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, warriors with agency and yeah. like he only did that because he felt weak when he was a kid mm. and maybe he got beat up. Mm. He never told me that, but you know, there's, there's experiences that people have as children. Um, I was weak as a young man. I got beat up as a young man. I felt powerless. I felt stupid. Mm. And I found a way through my, you know, my teens and my early twenties to, um, become someone who is more grounded, more, un, more, uh, in touch with his feelings, yeah. um, feeling powerful without having to go inflict violence upon people. Mm. Um, and he became passionate about that. Yeah. And so he was wounded as a child and he found a way to become a kind of healer right. through martial arts. Yes. Right. Something yeah. you might not think of. It's like a doctor is a healer. It's like, right. yeah, but there's all kinds of ways of lifting other people up or who, who are in, in trouble. Yes. I think this is a great example and it, it brings to mind a lot of like the community centers or places where individuals do gather to uh, kind of cultivate a sense of togetherness and healing that could be more in the realm of athletics. Cause I think that's like a really beautiful way to bring a lot of healing, mm -hmm. um, not just martial arts, but other sports as well, but spiritual spaces as well, community spaces where often, I mean, it's hard to say for sure, but when I think about the experiences that I've had so far in my own local communities and when I've connected into those spaces, um, that the individual kind of at the head of that communal space mm -hmm. recognizes the potential of uh, coming together and facilitating experiences of um, self-development and healing in all areas of creative expression that often come from recognizing the role that it played in their own lives. Right. And that's not always going to look like someone moving into a professional role of it and mm -hmm. having you know, their life be dictated by the wounded healer in that sense. So that alternative way of expressing the wounded healer, I think I kind of wrote this down in our notes and I was like, do I want to go here? But like our artistic creative expression, I think so, so often is driven by deep wounding that comes from the artist's life. Mm -hmm. And there's this real sense of creating art to process one's own wounding yeah. that has this sort of uncanny way then of, as it's put out into the world of mm -hmm. affecting other people. And that kind of works as this almost indirect archetypal pattern of the wounded healer, because how many times I've like a, a an amazing like album, like brought you through a difficult time. Right. 
or felt that in diving into some art, artistic creative aspect brought a sense of rejuvenation to you. I think the wounded healer is finding modern ways of being expressed and people are feeling the impact of that and feeling healed through someone else's manifestations. Right. I think definitely uh, through music, music can be very healing. I think a lot of music that gets produced nowadays is about suffering, about mm -hmm. hurting, mm -hmm. and it does make people feel less alone. And the artist really can only channel that energy and communicate it properly if they've been through it and yeah. if they've processed it. And I mean, no, personally, I've like found creating music to be incredibly therapeutic. It's like a journal of some kind. Hasn't really had the, uh, the kind of healing impact on others around me, I don't think, in the same kind of way. But still, as, as a personal act, there's mm -hmm. certainly some healing in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the wounded healer really is this important um, pathway that people might find mm -hmm. um, on the developing road of individuation. And it often begins with that wounding of the personality and yeah. then recognizing the suffering that accompanies it. But as it teaches us to work with the material, we recognize that the wounded healer still often carries that, that deep wound inside of themselves, but they aren't being defined by it. They aren't allowing it to be this self-limiting, maladaptive behavioral pattern, you know, yeah. like it, it requires this real turning towards the wounding in a, in a way that I find can be extremely difficult for just anybody because you have to really look at the depth of what has happened. And I think our, our consciousness in trying to maintain a homeostasis will throw anything it it can in that in in front of that wounding to try and shield us from it yeah. and that could be some sort of um you know self-medicating type of habit distracting oneself looking for you know love and appreciation from another because they can't look at that deep wounding but there's a real deep sense of courage and willingness to go into those depths that come with the that archetypal pattern to face the full force of this type of trauma that can be incredibly destabilizing for an individual mm -hmm. but ultimately is the only path forward it's like you have to go through it you can't go around it Right, right. So the shadow comes up yeah. here. And obviously this is related to the shadow. Everything we talk about is it can be related back to the shadow um, in some way. But um, shadow integration is a form of healing, right? Mm. And maybe you're left to your own devices to figure out how to do that. And you have to find a way to sort of lean in, um, navigate those like dark waters of yourself, your banished energy, the rejected parts of, of, of who you are, you have to kind of go in there and process that stuff mm -hmm. and embrace it. And that's really painful. Um, but it's a skill, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of a part of becoming a wounded healer, becoming someone who can actually help others. It's like, it's a skill. And that process of leaning into your own wounds and actually finding a way to sort of, um, not repress, not bury or block it out, but to feel it, really let the body feel it because mm -hmm. it refused to, maybe yeah. or it just couldn't, didn't have the energy or the time to do so. Um, but to really embody that pain is part of um, a skill set mm -hmm. that I think that you can develop. And if after you've kind of done this shadow integration for yourself for years and it never stops, but you begin to develop skills for doing this. And this is why those skills can be helpful to other people. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. And I think on top of that, part of part of being this wounded healer is that you're processing your own shadow by helping other people process it at the same time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I don't think it's just like vicarious experience. Like if I heal you, I can feel healed as well. It's mm -hmm. like and it's like, no, you actually are healing by healing others. Mm -hmm. And if you have a deep wounding as a child, um, you know, if you help another child heal you are in some sense healing your own inner child yeah right yeah because in all these ways you're engaging with others but you're also engaging with yourself mm -hmm. and the wisdom that comes from that ability to empathize with others pain yeah it's not just you are, can say oh i've been there i know what you're going through but you can actually be there with them yes. now yeah and like i'm actually feeling my pain from my childhood mm -hmm. as you feel it and that's why we can resonate right now yeah and i can help I can help guide you in some ways through that pain 
as I guide myself. Yeah. And I have this reservoir of that painful energy that actually provides me this sort of like empathetic embodied wisdom that I can give to others through these practices. It's interesting because I think it's a very tricky, uh, path for the wounded healer to navigate because in working with a group of individuals who carry a similar wounding, you recognize that even as you've kind of done that shadow integration, that there's so many deep layers of your own trauma and wounding that it's never fully integrated. Like, what does that even mean? Full individuation, full integration. It's kind of just... Whenever anyone claims that, (laughs) it's like red flag. Right. Like, I've fully integrated my shadow. Right. It's like, no, no, you haven't. You're producing shadow every day. Yeah. Yeah. And it I think it gets easier and you uncover new levels and you're stronger, like ego stronger. You can hold that tension more. The relationship deepens, but there's always going to kind of be that sense of what could get constellated in that healing relationship that Mm -hmm. pulls you back. And as an example, like someone who might be a veteran who has then been called to guide others through this process of, of really tapping back into those experiences that have caused trauma um, guiding them along that path, being a support system, they may be in a much more balanced, grounded place with their own trauma from being, um, in service, but they have to recognize when those points might come up inside of themselves because that empathetic factor kind of flows both ways. It both allows you to be present with someone in a way that, you might say like a regular therapist who, you know, wasn't in the military Mm -hmm. won't ever truly get, but at the same time, your own trauma can be constellated, brought forward and throwing, you know, you off in some way. So the wounded healer has to be on, on their, on on the tip of their toes, very aware of what's happening inside of themselves because that desire to want to heal your own wounding by helping others can cause you to get caught in those kinds of loops where you might be not fully connected to what's happening, you know, inside of yourself, because maybe you're looking too much outward or Mm. it builds up inside of you. So it's, it's tricky, I think for the wounded healer, because yeah, they're really coming from a difficult place and that both makes them extremely powerful. Uh, they have a fluidity of a kind of language of understanding mm-hmm. of navigating these wounds with other individuals, but they have to maintain a self care and their own therapy or their own nurturance because the shadow material within you will still come forward. Right. Right. It, it is a dangerous territory to venture into. And that's just the way it is. There's, there's no way around that. And that's mm-hmm. something that, you know, needs to be understood by the healer and the person being healed Mm -hmm. entering into this kind of relationship. Yeah. Um, as you're saying, it's like the, the empathetic sort of resonance goes both ways. And you as a healer can project things onto the person you're trying to heal and the other way around. Yeah. And you can kind of get locked into this like strange, like, um, shadow territory that you're entering with someone. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important for someone who is in a position of healing no matter what that is, if you're a guide or a counselor or um, a licensed therapist mm-hmm. or a doctor, there has to be deep sovereignty, deep agency on part of the healer in a way where they really know what they're doing. They understand how to not get into inappropriate territory. They know how to not let themselves uh, get locked into something that's really not uh, helpful, not healthy, mm-hmm. um, without completely locking that part of themselves out. And that's yeah. why it's like this weird balance. Yes. It's like you have to be in touch with your own wounding without letting that kind of like uh, open up into like a shared wounding that kind of yes. has this weird feedback loop. Yes. And that's very, very tricky, yeah. which is why anyone in the position of healer, no matter what, has a serious responsibility yeah. and they had to develop a serious skill. Yeah. And anyone who is doing this can't be doing it. Um, I mean, there's plenty of reasons why you might be doing it. Like if, you, if you're making money as, as some sort of healer, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But that shouldn't be the primary reason you're doing this, right? Yes. It's like the primary yeah. reason should really be like the deep uh, desire to heal people. Mm-hmm. Like that comes first. Like yeah. I would do this for free mm-hmm. because I feel so passionate about it because I feel so moved by the act of healing people. Yeah. In addition to that, if I can make some money doing it so I can live... That's great, mm. but it shouldn't be the other way around, right? It's like, this is a great way to make money. Right. 
because then, you know, your priorities might be out of whack and you yeah. might find yourself pushing people in a direction that isn't actually helping them, yeah. but it's just helping you. Yeah. And so that's why this whole landscape and even us, we're in this right now. Mm-hmm. We need to be mindful. We're not perfect. Mm-hmm. We're not claiming that we know exactly what we're doing perfectly. Yeah. But this whole landscape that's opened up of like the healing realm, which is certainly not restricted to being a licensed therapist anymore. Mm-hmm. It's a dangerous realm yeah and people need to be careful yeah there is also kind of another angle to this where individuals who've gone through some sort of wounding i think especially from a young age or where like the family environment was particularly hectic Hmm. become attuned to really the disturbances of others of looking for it in the environment and then having this like natural reaction to want to fix things or to yeah. heal things um, because they had to take on that role at a very young age, you might say. Mm-hmm. And it can cause this kind of distortion of the archetype I feel because it's in some ways like a compulsion to heal that mm-hmm. is, so driven by that desire to want to bring balance or um, kind of closing the loop of their own original wounding, but rather from it being a place of a more integrated recognition of the wounding, there's, I don't know how else to say it. It's just like this heavy compulsive need to, you know, I I sense, you know, the offness here, like, let me start giving advice to my friend or, Mm. you know, taking on too much if you moved into a professional space. And so those who I think who have experienced those woundings from a young age need to be aware of how that can drive you and not be coming fully from a place where the wounded healer has been fully integrated with the experience to a degree that allows them to do this in a balanced way. Um, And I think that's because rather the wounding or the trauma still has some unconscious elements that's causing it to be more um, of that compulsion towards healing and almost this like need to do it that would cause a sense of stress or anxiety if that did not happen. Mm. So it would speak to the individual needing to do more of their own kind of personal self-work before really extending themselves out to others so that they didn't create some sort of situation uh, where there could be like a re-wounding on either side. Let's talk about the mythology of the wounded healer. Yeah. So there's two prominent wounded healer myths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The first one is Chiron. Yeah, Chiron. He's definitely like the big one, I would say. Of uh, It's really interesting, actually, in and fully kind of walking through Chiron's wounded healing. Most people talk about how Chiron received this wound um, by being poisoned accidentally by Hercules' arrow, and and that's why they kind of associate him with this, this kind of wounding, which comes in the latter end of his life. Mm. Um, and to me, it's like, no, 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 let's scale back a little bit further. Let's go to the origins of Chiron to really understand this archetypal pattern. Mm-hmm. So Chiron is a, a, a god, actually, because he's a son of Kronos, who's uh, Zeus's dad. So Kronos took the form of a horse and he impregnated um, Chiron's mother and he was born half horse, half man. Mm -hmm. He's a centaur and his mother abandons him, you know, kind of feeling horrified by him being a centaur. And in Greek mythology, centaurs are usually these really wild, uh, angry, uh, violent, very instinctive, just very, very in touch with the animal-like instincts of being a beast. The Chiron is, uh, kind and generous and wise and very human-like but he's abandoned very early on by his mother taken in by apollo and artemis and taught uh healing medicine herbs uh, taught how to hunt 
um, music, art, poetry, mm-hmm. all these amazing things. And through this education, he sort of becomes known in the greater Greek mythology as kind of like the Greek hero daycare. Like pretty much every major Greek hero has spent time with Chiron. It's kind mm-hmm. of, it's, it's actually quite fascinating, mm-hmm. but he like lives up in the forest and eventually you know, another major character comes through and is nurtured and kind of adopted by Chiron. So Theseus, Perseus, Hercules, um, Achilles, Ajax, all these major heroes at some point in time came into his care and he became that parent. And I really sort of saw this connection of like an original wounding from losing his mother being abandoned both by his mother and father and seeing that throughout the arc of Chiron's life, he passed on these skills. He nurtured all of these Greek heroes who go on to do all these incredible things, but he's enacting this uh, wounded healer archetype by taking in the fostered children Mm -hmm. and being the nurturer that he didn't have. Right. I think another interesting um, dimension of Chiron that may or may not be the consensus of historians or uh, um, people who study myth, but like Chiron is half man, half beast. Mm-hmm. So there's a wounding right there. Yeah. Right. He's like, his identity is split in half. Mm. There's sort of a feeling like, what am I? But there's also this kind of notion of being in touch with like the, you know, the more animalistic side, mm-hmm. sort of like the light and the shadow yeah, or the conscious and unconscious realm is he's like actually forced to straddle it all the time. So he's sort of like his identity as half man, half beast is sort of like this liminal identity yes. that he's, he's like crossing between these mm-hmm. two worlds yeah. and that a lot of like what healing is or the, the path of individuation the path of growth involves bridging between these realms of like integration and disintegration, Mm. light and dark being present and conscious, but also dipping into the unconscious regularly to integrate those contents. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's like a really interesting way to look at, at Chiron. I mean, just like even as a character, you could, if you were to look at him as a character, it would be a strange thing Mm -hmm. of like, what are you, you know? (laughs) Because there is sort of like the peaceful wise, like human on top and there's like the the beast on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's like a deep wounding, a deep loneliness probably that he's had to kind of get through to get to a point where he's like now feels passionate about taking in all the lost children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that sense of being like the liminal being of that stark duality is we'll get into this because we're going to talk about shamanism, but it's very characteristic of being able to move between worlds to truly be present consciously and unconsciously as a healer that makes you both effective, but also uh, able to approach things holistically. You know, you can see the manifest behavior, you know, in front of someone or the, the things that they're experiencing in their body. And yet you can go deep as well. You can pierce into the unconscious layers. And so to me, the wounded healer needs to kind of move between those worlds. Mm-hmm. And Chiron does encapsulate that in a way that I also see uh, anchored within the archetype of the shaman who's another wounded healer that we'll get into. But Mm. um, sort of before we move forward, the other kind of major uh, wounded healer myth is Asclepius, Mm -hmm. which I feel like I'm going to say wrong because I'm always... We we looked it up. I'm pretty sure it's Asclepius. (laughs) I I You were saying Asclepius for a while, but... (laughs) Asclepius is what uh, Google at least is telling us. Asclepius, you just read something and you say no. it for like ever years and years. But, no. um, but this is, is as in the rod of Asclepius, yes, right? And this is yeah. sort of like the, the medical symbol yeah. that we see yes. everywhere. Okay. The <laughs> snake yeah. wrapped around the staff. Yes, a single snake wrapped around a single rod. And not to be confused with the Caduceus, Hermes staff, which has the twin snakes and the wings This is actually, this is like also going on a sidebar, but Western medicine has adopted Asclepius's rod as a, as a symbol of medicine, Mm -hmm. understandably, but they also got Hermes staff confused. So you'll actually see both Hmm. depending on They're not related, the two rods in in mythology? There's Mm -hmm. not some connection there? Not necessarily, no, Hmm. no. Interesting. So Asclepius's rod uh, has that wound snake up around it. Um which I'll get into in a moment, but Asclepius, of course, was another 
adopted child of Chiron mm. and was taught medicine and herbs and healing by Chiron and went on to basically become like the foremost healer in, you know, all of Greece and sort of historically. And I think in some versions he is the son of Apollo, but was also like abandoned, brought into Chiron, raised by Chiron and goes on to surpass like the healing powers of like basically any known person. And um, he is someone who kind of carries that myth of the, the wounded physician, but established this kind of oasis of healing where people would come and uh, there would be like this ceremonial process of incubation where they would be cleansed and purified. And once sort of uncontaminated, they would go to sleep at night and have some sort of dream. And then the the kind of priest of Asclepius would come and they would, they say like, this is a healing dream and they would do some interpretation. And there's this whole process, really a very symbolic process of coming into the space that Asclepius had um, fostered and bringing healing to individuals and in some ways, continuing to pass on the skill sets that Chiron had gained from being his own wounded healer, now um, amplified to this whole other level. So Asclepius is this really dynamic version of the wounded healer, but his story's interesting. Shall I sh- shall I tell about Go his? Go for it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Asclepius um, was tasked for some reason to bring somebody back from the dead. And was kind of like, you know, he, there's no, there's no doing that in Greek mythology, really, Mm. unless you're like a major God who can do that. But uh, the story kind of goes that, you know, Asclepius was considering how he might do this and sort of like, eh, it's not going to happen. And the snake kind of slithers up and starts wrapping itself around his staff and he kind of knocks it again. It's a rock and he kills the snake. And then another snake comes bearing this herb of some kind, a plant. And he starts to do it again to knock the snake, except this time it brings back to life this other snake. And this is kind of where you get that imagery of the snake wrapping around the staff. Um, And he is able to now heal people, bring them back from the dead. And Hades, Lord of the underworld, becomes very upset with this. You know, this is kind of... Asclepius, can he heal the dead or the Mm -hmm. snake can? Asclepius can because the snake brought the herb. Okay. So he found out this way to bring people back from the dead. Okay. So he starts doing that and people are, you know, coming to him maybe to have certain people raised back and uh, the natural order of the world now is being thrown off Mm. and Hades is really angry. And so Zeus uh, strikes Asclepius dead with a lightning bolt. And that's kind of the end of his story, Mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Nice and clean. Nice and clean. But the wounded healer of Asclepius really brought in this potentiality for healing to be amplified uh, across the nation really to all these different people to get them in touch with this purity of soul and heart to have the healing dreams but there's a way where things become you might say inflated and i think that's kind of the moral of the story or how to look about it symbolically psychologically Mm. is that you know the healing can only really go so far and if we start to move into this territory where ego becomes inflated where our role as healer is becoming bigger than it should, then we may be struck down, you know, by like that hand of God. So it kind of brings in that lesson of needing to keep oneself in balance as they walk this path of the healer to not go too far, to not over promise what you can do, to not push yourself, to not try to bend the kind of uh, natural order um, otherwise there will be consequences. Interesting. Yeah. That ties into sort of like seeking out the, uh, the fountain of youth or, uh, the Holy, the, the Holy grail, grail yeah. of people <laughs> seeking out immortality and yeah. that, that actually just drives you towards destruction right. to, to seek this out. It's not a power that we're actually meant to possess. Yeah. And I think it's, 
and I mean, this is a total tangent that I won't go on, but I do think that's sort of an interesting commentary on like modern medicine mm. is like, should we, if, if technology yeah. keeps improving, should we keep extending life? Right. Should we actually pers- be pursuing trying to live forever? Yeah. If the technology exists for people to live like up to 200 years, yeah. should they? Mm. And like, so like, that's a, a question that I think we actually might be confronted with like yeah. in who knows how soon, but like in the next century, maybe it's true. of like, is it right to extend life? Mm. Should people even live beyond the age of 80, even now? Yeah. It's like, I think it's a, a, a difficult question. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that the aim of living, for instance, is to live as long as possible. Yeah. It's not what I would argue. The aim is to pass the torch. That's what I would say. <laughs> but it's an, it's an interesting, um, aspect of this, of this mythology yes. is, uh, the pursuing medicine for the sake of raising the dead mm-hmm. perhaps is, is misguided. Yeah. And instead the, the path of healing should be to, um, help people bring them into balance, bring them into completeness, but yeah. not to overly obsess over self actualization right. or ascending to the power of a God. Yeah. That's never works in Greek mythology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyone who tries to uh, wrestle the power of the gods into their hands are usually struck down in yeah. some form. And it speaks to, I think, the human desire towards power and the kind of god complex of like feeling that archetypal energy like flowing through you and how that can go so dangerously wrong when we try to become gods when we are messing with power that is something that we truly do not understand and you can look at it as like the potentiality of medicine to grow into this place where we're really trying to wrestle back from the gods the ability to to give life and to take life away or even like the destructive powers of nuclear bombs you might say it's like we don't understand what we're playing with here and these very old stories caution against that kind of ego driven uh dynamic that often leads to some sort of destruction because Mm -hmm. we're we're dealing with the archetypal powers of the gods themselves. Mm. Shamanism. Yeah. Should we uh, inject this in at the end? Yeah. This is a, a pretty salient topic, I bet, for a lot of people listening. Yeah. Um, interested in the idea of shamanism or yeah. what it means to be a shaman. There's definitely a sort of neo-shamanism, which is yeah. an interesting development, mm-hmm. I think. But how how do we even define a shaman? What does it even mean? That's a good question. There's such a like overarching uh, way that that word has come to encompass the the medicine man, you might say, the the healer of the tribe, the the liminal individual who moves between worlds, mm-hmm. who's not necessarily you know the chief or the mayor or the head of the community, yet is a backbone of spirituality and of healing and guidance the shaman is someone who is both present here in the in the middle world you might say in Mm -hmm. shamanic terms or here presently but they see through the veil and this seeing through the veil allows them to have prophetic dreams to heal others to connect into those other dimensions you might say and is often brought about because of some kind of deep initiatory uh challenge that is i think why the shaman is a wounded healer because they're called into this work either by some sort of uh, wounding that's happened to them naturally or by being initiated in through a really intense dynamic challenging um set of events that makes them capable to take on this role that they've seen so much and they've powered through it that they've been sort of upgraded in this way that now they can take on this role of spiritual leadership right so going back to chiron not to say that chiron's a shaman i don't want to make that connection too strong but i still think it's interesting to explore the bridge between different worlds um, the bridge between shadow and light, I think is an interesting way to phrase it, or the, the, the bridge between this sort of conscious waking realm that we tend to think of as being quote unquote real life and the unconscious realm that we actually don't really understand very well. Mm-hmm. And the unconscious is where the shadow is. It's where we need to go to heal. Yeah. Usually there there is an, an embrace of like 
the dark side or the underworld, the place of pain, the place of repression that we need to journey to in order to unlock insights. And that might even just entail sort of um, the paradigm shifting. Mm -hmm. So like in, in waking life, we all have a kind of story or a narrative or some kind of paradigm that we live by. That like, this is the way things are. This is what I'm about. This is what my relationships are about. This is what my community is about. And we can kind of be locked into that, that paradigm. Mm. And what we were talking about earlier is the idea that something can happen that comes like you might just like get hit by some sort of spiritual train almost that like yeah. derails you completely right. and your entire paradigm gets obliterated mm. and it's only then that all these insights pour in of yeah. like oh my yeah. god i have been locking out so much information i've been yeah. locking out so many um so many dimensions of reality that i didn't want to see and i now have a new path because i see a new path that mm -hmm. i could not see before until i was hit by that train yeah and so that sort of breaking of the frame yes is something that shamans do yes. right yes. and that might involve stereotypically like drugs for instance mm -hmm. like you take you take drugs and your frame is shattered yeah. and suddenly you're like seeing the world in all these different ways all these insights might pop in all these things that you normally don't pay attention to are suddenly incredibly salient right. and the things that you normally pay attention to when you're sober are no longer very salient they mm -hmm. don't really matter yeah so that kind of uh that sort of skill of um, helping other individuals or even helping yourself kind of deframe your paradigm yes. in order to let in new insights and sort of recalibrate the paradigm yeah. Yeah. is something that shamans might be said to, to be masters in. Yeah, in absolutely. Way. They've basically moved out of ordinary reality, which we might call like conscious egos waking uh, reality. And they've, come into collision with the dimensions of the unconscious and that's going to be colored by all of these like cultural forms and it's going to take on all of these different qualities depending on where that kind of shamanic origin is but ultimately it is like the deep intertwining of the unconscious realm that the shaman learns and they can go deep within themselves to pull out these healing insights or to become like the the sort of soothsayer of the tribe because they see more than just what ego wants to see or does see and that deframing allows not only things to be elevated and considered in their own life but rather they are called to kind of be the guides for a greater community for a tribe for a city um for a group of individuals that their the shaman is facilitating them that experience of of awakening another individual's unconscious dynamics and and initiating them into that to different degrees of uh potential but they become these sort of masters fluidly able to dance between the waking normal reality and those other spaces where the unconscious lives and uh sings and and grows and breathes and speaks and that's why you'll have them connecting with these kind of archetypal power animals or going into these different dimensions of reality to retrieve parts of the soul like these splintered psyches aspects of other individuals shadows and carrying them with them and breathing them back into a person like they they move between these realities because they've allowed themselves to become that liminal um uh, vessel and that comes because they allowed themselves to be deeply stressed uh ego had to break down it had to become relativized by recognizing those other energies at play so they go on the vision quest they take some drugs maybe like plant medicine um, they do pretty extreme physical challenges starvation being exposed out for several days it's like what happens ego just melts away the the conscious frame has to be um, broken down and all of these other elements come forward visions images dreams insights the whisperings of the unconscious and that brings this quality of like you know real like numinosity like you know that the spirits of my ancestors spoke to me but it's really getting in touch with that deep unconscious material that drives so much growth and individuation and then they become um, the bearers of that for their people. 
we'll probably cover shamanism in a future episode, mm. I bet. Mm-hmm. But just to end this discussion, we all have a quote from Carl Jung himself. A good half of every treatment that probes at all deeply consists in the doctor examining himself. It is his own hurt that gives a measure of his power to heal. This and nothing else is the meaning of the Greek myth of the wounded physician. Beginning this Wednesday, February 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time at the STOA, we'll be beginning a speaker series where we'll be inviting various authors or therapists or Jungian analysts, sort of from the extended Jungian community, you might say. And the first guest speaker we're going to have is James. Hollis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. James Hollis is a real powerful figure in the Jungian community. He, I believe, is turning 81 years old this year and has been a author of over 16 books covering all different types of topics uh, in the Jungian world, Under Saturn's Shadow, Like Wounding of Men, Living Between Worlds, his new book, Prisms. And not only that, you know, he's a teacher. You can just look up his videos, um, online, some free classes that he's given. Um, he teaches on the young platform, all these different elements where James Halls has touched the world of, uh, the Jungian community and brought this real, uh, approachable, grounded, understandable, uh, tone and voice to Jungian work. So, uh, it's a real, honored to be able to be kicking off this new series with Dr. Hollis because he is just such a wealth of knowledge. And on Wednesday, he'll be covering a couple of key topics about the shadow. First and foremost is the path of the wounded healer, which is um, one of the chapters from his new book, Prisms, where he goes a little bit more deeply into this topic, which is why we covered it today Mm -hmm. on the podcast. We'll also be talking about Um, the necessary steps of developing one's own personal myth. We may get into the masculine shadow um, as well and just really trying to tap into this well and depth of uh, insight and wisdom that Dr. Hollis has. And he'll be joining us uh, for a discussion and also an audience Q&A. So if you attend, you may be able to ask him a question of your own. Right. So if you want to attend, just to be super clear, this is not happening on this podcast Mm -hmm. we're not having james hollis on our podcast not yet at (laughs) least uh he's going to appear at the stoa which is sort of an online zoom venue yeah so if you haven't checked it out yet we've been running events there but you can go to the stoa.ca you can find the event it's called shadow play the path of the wounded healer with james hollis and you can rsvp it's free um and in the following weeks after him we are going to have Lisa Marciano mm-hmm. from This Jungian Life. Yeah, host of This Jungian Life. She'll be talking about motherhood in the shadow. Uh, Dr. John Beebe, who is a Jungian analyst and has a real focus on typology, Jungian typology, will be speaking about the shadows of personality and dreams. So uh, it'll be a really exciting couple of weeks happening at the STOA where we'll be bringing in... Um, experts and explorers in the realm of the shadow to really share their insights and cover all these different perspectives. And each event will have that audience element. So if you're able to attend, uh, come with your burning questions for our guests. Yeah, we'd love to have you. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow org. Do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze? Head over to goldenshadow.org to submit your dream for possible interpretation on a future episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time.